So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our first session, which will be a conversation with the German Minister of Defense, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, who is in conversation with Costanza Stelzenmuller, senior fellow um, at the Center of the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. And given that Germany, of course, took over the presidency of the European Union on the 1st of July, this is a very timely conversation. So enjoy the forum. Hello, my name is Constanze Stelzenmüller. I'm a senior fellow at the Center on the US and Europe at the Brookings Institution. Minister Annegret kramp kaunbauer welcome and thank you so much for being the guest of honor for our opening conversation. Bitte schön, sehr gerne. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. We are pre-recording this conversation a day ahead to allow for synchronization of the minister's remarks. And the minister is in Berlin and I'm in Washington. So at nearly 6,700 kilometers apart, we're also preserving the appropriate social distance. <laughs> Ordinarily, Minister kram karrenbauer this week would be the beginning of Germany's political summer vacation. But Germany has just taken on the EU presidency on July 1st in a truly historic moment for the future of Europe. And you've just been in the news headlines for cracking down hard on Germany's special forces unit, the KSK, for allegations of right-wing extremist activities. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I'd like to start us off by asking about another troop issue, which has been the subject of a lot of international news coverage lately and which takes us straight into some really thorny geostrategic issues for Europe and Germany. And of course, you know what I'm talking about, the Trump administration's announcements, announcement that there is, um, it intends to pull nearly a third of US troops out of Germany. Now, we know there is some disagreement clearly between the White House and Congress on whether this is a good idea. But since the president appears to be very determined, Let's begin by discussing the impl implications of this announcement. And I want to start with Russia. I think you and I are both keenly aware Russia is still waging a proxy war in eastern Ukraine. It's claimed more than 13,000 lives in five years. Berlin has also threatened the Kremlin with additional sanctions because of what it says was a contract killing ordered by Russia in Berlin last August. So I want to ask you, does the White House talking about removing a third of US troops from Germany while at the same time inviting Vladimir Putin back into the G7 undermine Europe's security? How worried are you that this undermines the transatlantic alliance deterrence? Indeed, the question about a U.S. troop presence in Germany is not really primarily a bilateral question. We are an important base for U.S. troops. They are big facilities like Rammstein. They are a hub for international missions. Landstuhl is a big military hospital for many American soldiers wounded on operations in Grafenwer, there's a big training site. So we on German soil are also contributing to American security. What we are discussing is the security of the alliance, though, because the U.S. troops especially serve the security of the alliance for all partners, and they serve America's um, security. So if there are troop reductions in Germany, which we regret if the decision is being taken, then the question is where the soldiers deploy. Do they redeploy to the United States or are they moved towards the Indian Ocean or do they redeploy within Europe? If they were redeploying within Europe, then that would mean that the strong commitment of the United States in the transatlantic partnership and the focus on Europe will remain, and that would be an important message for NATO, and it's something I discussed with Mark Esper. Thank you very much. Um, President Trump did say recently that some U.S. troops that are now based in, US, in, in Germany might be relocated to Poland and possibly to other Eastern European countries. 
German diplomacy in the past has objected to such forward basing because they say this violates the NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997. Critics in the US, and particularly in Eastern Europe, say this agreement has been rendered obsolete by Russia's acts of aggression from the annexation mm -hmm. of Crimea to Ukraine and other things. What's your view? In NATO, we continue to agree that the Founding Act is an important document besides other international agreements. It represents an agreement that you want to work with each other in good faith. And yes, it's true, it's become more difficult to fly the flag of the Founding Act, also due to the Russian behavior. But we have maintained so far that we are not the ones who actively want to violate this agreement. You know that the figures in the Founding Act are open to interpretation. So far, we've always been able to agree on a certain scale, and it is something that the SECURE and the NATO Secretary General has again made clear in the discussion with our American partners. We see that Russia is more assertive, more aggressive, but I think the strength of NATO is also that we don't play tit for tat. Very good point. Um, now, this isn't the first time that President Trump has called the US commitment to the alliance with Europe into question. In fact, John Bolton's recent book has confirmed that he wanted to take America out of NATO. Now, you just told us, and many others have also reminded the White House, that American troops in Europe also serve US national goals, for example, in the Middle East. Fine. But here's my question. Imagine you're in an elevator with the next president of the United States, and you have three minutes to convince him that Europe's security is also America's security. What's your main argument in those three minutes? America needs allies. It needs like-minded allies based on the same values. And those are especially the states in Europe. And these states will only be able to maintain their independence and their values if they have a strong defense foundation. And this foundation can only be achieved together with the United States of Europe. And therefore, a strong Europe is always an ally to further American interests and American values. Interesting that you said Vereinigte Staaten von Europa. Um, we may come to that later on. But let me, let me ask one final question on this topic. We all know, uh, it's no secret here in Washington, that the current president of the United States is not, is not one of Germany's biggest fans. But criticism of Germany's defense spending or of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project is much broader and much more bipartisan here in Washington. It's also very much, as you know, shared in Central and Eastern Europe and not just in Poland, who are probably our sharpest critics. So how do you, as a committed transatlanticist throughout your own professional career, answer this criticism and make the case not just in Washington, but in Warsaw, Bucharest and Tallinn, that Germany is a reliable ally? First point, when we talk about burden sharing and about the question of how we in Germany want to uphold our NATO commitment, then we are talking above all that we pledged in NATO to contribute 10% of all military capabilities by 2030 through the Bundeswehr. That means we deliver 10% and we benefit of 90% that our allies, our friends and neighbors contribute for us. And therefore, the question of spending more for defense is one that is in our very own interest, and it does not have anything to do with the current American administration. By the way, other presidents also uh, raised this point critically in the past. Now, when we're talking about energies, energy supply, Nord Stream 2, everyone knows, and I'm happy to admit that it's 
not a project close to my heart, but it is a project that was started many governments ago, and it's nearing completion now. And there are three points of criticism. One, that we are becoming too dependent on Russian gas, but at the same time, we are diversifying our own energy supply in Europe, so using other energy sources, liquefaction, alternative energies, renewable energies, that's all becoming more prominent here. The second point refers to the legitimate interests of Ukraine or Eastern European states like Poland. We are advocating for them in the negotiations at the moment. The third point is whether we are helping Russia to finance its military spending. It's certainly not only the case for Nord Stream 2. And another point, of course, we're also talking about economic interests. And yes, there are economic interests in the United States when it comes to natural gas and shale gas. Those are very legitimate interests, but I am um, I'm a proponent of openly discussing these questions among friends. All right. Thank you very much. I think that was a very, very comprehensive um, answer, which no doubt will be he heard with some interest here. So let's stay with geostrategic issues for the moment, but move on to a global competitor that recently has become an even greater concern for the alliance and for Europe. And that, of course, is China and its quest for dominance, not just in its own neighborhood, but increasingly in Europe's periphery and in Europe itself. The Trump administration sees China as America's key strategic threat, of course, but NATO, too, has become to discuss China, and the EU has referred to China as a strategic rival. Chancellor Merkel postponed the EU-China summit in September that was supposed to be one of the highlights of the presidency, officially because of the pandemic, but clearly this is also the way out of something of a diplomatic embarrassment. And the tone between the West and China has become extremely harsh. At the same time, China is the EU's second most important trading partner. Let me begin by asking you to explain what exactly is the nature of the Chinese threat to Europe and the EU these days? When we look at China, there are three realities that are all equally valid. The first reality is that China indeed is a systemic challenge for us. It is a large country with a regime that shows that you can work successfully economically without needing to have the same standards in terms of human rights, civil liberties, democracy. That is a first in mankind. A second point is that China is certainly one of the big players that we need if we want to address the big challenges of mankind. Climate change, addressing that without China is not possible, and that's why we need good cooperation. The third reality is that China is an important economic partner, especially for the European Union, and we must find a way to ensure that we can use our economic ties in order to demonstrate our views, our values, and where China is aggressively trying to further its own interests, we must send clear messages. If we see that China is trying to increase its influence in international organizations, not to further multilateralism, but to push its own interests, then we must not weaken the international organizations. On the contrary, we must engage stronger there. And if China is perceived as an aggressive actor in the Indo-Pacific area by its neighbors and makes territorial claims, then it's also about the freedom of navigation, which is an important asset for world trade. And here, too, we are called upon to set or make clear messages through phonops, for example. Thank you very much. Um, the logical question that comes next, of course, is what are Europe's options? In strictly military terms, European capabilities, at least compared to those of the US and China, are laughable. 
but in the economic and diplomatic field, there are much more serious tools. Specifically, should the European Union and Germany limit or prevent strategic investments by China in the physical or digital infrastructure of Europe? Of course, I'm thinking in particular of the Huawei case. And should there be a, a European or German agency to review the national security implications of foreign direct investments based on the American CFIUS model? If necessary, prohibit them. One point that I want to talk about is that, especially with a view to the Indo-Pacific, we need to think about the countries that are close to us in terms of value there, the like-minded states, and that we cooperate with them more than in the past. I know that they sometimes feel a little bit left behind by us in the European Union or NATO, and a stronger cooperation here would be an important point. The second point has something to do with our own security structure, our infrastructure in Europe. In Germany, we said that we don't per se want to exclude companies from competitions, from tenders like the 5G network, but we want to define safety standards, and that includes, for example, to what extent a business can act independently of state access. We want to make that a criterion of whether someone is admitted to the competition competition or not. So indeed, we need to make our infrastructure more secure against external influence. That is true for China, but also for the attacks that we see from the Russian side. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me stay for a moment with the question of China's behavior in its own neighborhood or, in fact, in its own country. Because the way we think about that as Europeans defines also how far we think the geostrategic reach of European influence ought to go, not just to protect European interests, but perhaps also to, def to defend European values. And specifically, I'm thinking here of Chinese concentration camps and coercive birth control for a million Uyghurs threatening gestures in the direction of Taiwan and the new security law for Hong Kong, which effectively ends any autonomy for the former British province. Now, you just said um, something which I, uh, for which I have great sympathy, which is that we need to be better allies to the democracies in the Indo-Pacific region and that we need to give them more support and not just because of our values, because also we're protecting our trade interests with this. but. Do Europe's strategic interests require Europe to be even stronger? In other words, should we be more formally disapproving of what China is doing here? As the, as the, should the EU Commission use stronger diplomacy? And should Germany, as a non-permanent member, which is chairing the EU, the, sorry, the UN Security Council this month in July, should Germany perhaps also um, use stronger terms on a national level? What are our options there? Zuerst möchte ich noch einmal sehr deutlich machen, wenn wir über First of all, let me make it clear that when we talk about our values, we talk about individual freedoms and dignity, about the inviolability of the person. We talk about no one being discriminated against due to faith, background or gender. Those are not specific Western values. Those are universal human rights. Those are the foundation on which the United Nations Nations was founded, and that's why I feel that it's our obligation, us who have benefited from these values and live such privileged lives, that we help to make sure that people everywhere in the world can partake in these values. And addressing these questions with China and to China is, we need to do that again and again, and we know that 
it's easy and it gives you a good feeling inside if you use strong words. But we also know that this approach is often one that blocks every contact and every possible influence. We in Germany have maybe not always with a very loud voice, but we've always behind the scenes talked about the human rights in China, supported dissidents during the Cold War with Russia as well, and we've been able to be successful there. So I believe that it's important that we're consistent, that we stand closely side by side. And when I mentioned the international organizations before, they are important to ensure and safeguard our values and interests. but. If we see that a strong language would be counterproductive, we should really think about whether it's more than a feel-good moment and whether it really makes us help make progress. Fair enough. What you've just described is the classical dilemma of a middle power. But I would say the European Union is perhaps no longer only a middle power. So let me ask you on one point, if worst comes to worst, should Germany or should in fact the EU join the UK in offering visas to political refugees to Hong Kong? Is that an option? It is completely understandable that countries like the UK are discussing this question and the situation shows that were the UK still part of the EU, we would have a very different uh, situation because then it would be on the agenda of all of the EU. We see that it's being discussed in Canada, in Australia, and if it's about sending a strong message also to those who are fighting for their freedom and for their rights, for what is being enshrined in the Hong Kong constitution, then I think this could be a strong sign of solidarity. But it is something that needs to be closely coordinated, especially with the UK. Fair enough. Let me move to another more EU-centric topic, which of course is the role of defence and security policy at the European level. We've been talking about this, of course, <coughs> since the Saint Malo summit in 98, but the EU has really ramped up its efforts in this field recently with the European Defence Fund and with PESCO Permanent Structured Cooperation. But the pandemic, of course, is going to really severely limit European Union funding. In the German presidency programme, the security topic has been relegated to the very last chapter on the last two pages, and the draft EU budget chapter on defence is much reduced, sadly. So seriously, isn't the project of a European defense policy at best on life support with a ventilator? What's real about this? Tatsache ist, dass die Frage, wie das Budget ausgestattet ist, schon In fact, the budget size was already reduced before coronavirus made the budget situation even more difficult. And that is why it is all the more important that all our national budget efforts are linked cleverly with the European budgets in the European Defense Fund, especially when it comes to to military mobility, because the transfer of troops through Europe is one of the assets in collective defense of NATO, and it works only well if we have the right infrastructure. But investing in infrastructure has um, an added value. It's not just for the military, but it also serves civilian needs. Another point, well, behind defense spending, is hidden a lot of spending for equipment and materiel. And this spending contributes to many countries, also in France, for example, represents economic clout. And especially now, during the coronavirus crisis, it is important that the contracts that we have planned are not cancelled, because otherwise we would exacerbate the economic crisis, that is why it's important to stay committed here. And the third point, you mentioned PESCO, and here it is very important for Germany during our council presidency that we finalize third party participation so that we can continue 
equipment cooperations with the US, with the UK in future. And that is why we need to finally find a solution to this question now. All right. Um, interesting. I would still say that all of that sounds like something that you can do within NATO um, and that you don't need the EU for. Um, and this is not to be in any way sort of to, to want to detract from the EU. I am a committed Europeanist. But I, but I do want to push you here. Um, we know you're a committed transatlanticist. Um, you're also a NATO loyalist. You have not, unlike your predecessor, Ursula von der Leyen, been heard to talk about a European army, uh, which I think is probably a relief. Um, but you wrote a piece in the Financial Times in May, which made some rather interesting points. Um, you say that NATO, to remain relevant, it needs to stick to its principles, democracy, liberty, rule of law, improve its capabilities and readiness, get better at combating national, uh, non-traditional security challenges, and build resilience. To me, a lot of that actually sounded like a checklist for the European Union. So can you be a little more sort of specific as to what the European Union, as opposed to NATO, contributes here that complements NATO's remit rather than detracting from it or duplicating it. What's the value added that the EU brings? Ich möchte es an, an zwei ähm, Beispielen äh, deutlich machen. Ähm, das eine ist ganz sicherlich die. Ähm, I'd like to demonstrate this with two examples. The first one is certainly our capability when it comes to space. Space is one of the most important domains for the future, one that is strongly dominated by the Americans, by the Chinese, and where we as Europeans know that we can only survive in this competition if we do it together. We've recently founded an agency for space, defense and equipment, and this is a typical field where European excellency can better thrive and where we can be complementary to what we are discussing in NATO. Second point, there are situations, security situations that affect the security situation in Europe, for example, Africa, the Sahel region, and the terrorist threat that emanates from there, the unresolved migrant issue that is being exacerbated by climate change. That is something that first and foremost affects European security interests. And that's why Europeans need to give a stronger response here. We do that with European training missions in the Sahel, for example, or with a coalition of the willing under French leadership in counter-terrorism, and as Europeans we need to be better able to act, but to do that we need common capabilities. We may have the EU battle groups, but what we're lacking is a common strategic compass. We haven't got a common threat perception yet of how to approach operations. We come from very different backgrounds and traditions, and that's why we have this idea to establish a strategic compass and have a common threat analysis and that's what we want to do over the next six months of our council presidency. haben wir uns jetzt vorgenommen in den nächsten sechs Monaten unserer Ratspräsidentschaft. Got it. All right. Now, the United States has been watching the European Defense Fund and PESCO like a hawk. And one of the more difficult things the German presidency will have to decide is what is diplomatically called third party participation, which translates mostly, but not only as American participation in European defense projects. Now, Germany has traditionally tended to buy American a lot anyway, but that's not true for all other EU member states, particularly one or two of the larger ones. Um, And certainly, we all know that other Europeans want to use these initiatives to build a more competitive European defense industry and protect it. So how does the German presidency square this circle? And does the UK come into this? 
When we talk about third state participation, we need to make a distinction. On the one hand, there is state participation that is less controversial, and on the other hand, and that is controversial, to what extent can companies from third states benefit from funds of the European Defence Fund? To what extent can they apply for these funds? At the end of the day, I believe it's about fair market access in both directions. The truth includes that many European defense companies are quite successful on the US market. I am a big proponent of fair and free trade enabling that. I believe that is better than blocking access to each other's markets or to hamper and prevent it through tariffs or other rules. From in Finland, we have a reasonable compromise on the table, and this compromise now needs to be finalized. It won't be an easy task, but there is a lot of confidence and expectation in the German Council Presidency that we can do that over the next six months, and we will work hard on it because it's important for our future relations also with the UK, especially in the area of cooperating in security and defense. Exactly. Well, thank you for reminding us of the, the value of reciprocity and free trade. Um, it's not, not, not fashionable thinking these days and not just among Republicans here in Washington, but um, I find it refreshing. A last point on the European Union, a, a term that keeps cropping up in European debates about the future of European security and defense policy is the need to preserve or gain strategic sovereignty. And we're looking now at a historically tense and competitive geostrategic, geostrategic environment for Europe. And that was the case even before the pandemic. So, and you and I, I think both are aware that there are profound divisions in Europe over this question. So what to you and what to the German presidency does sovereignty mean exactly? Having a common strategic understanding of security and defense policy is crucial so that we can link the different initiatives that exist already, the battle groups, the European Defense Fund, that we can consolidate them in a strategy. And the first step is that we agree on where the challenges and threats are for Europe, and indeed we have very different perceptions on that. Over the recent weeks I've had an intense exchange with my colleagues from Northern Europe and with colleagues from the Baltic states. Next week I will travel through the Visegrad states and the perception of the Russian threat, for example, is a very different one there than in the southern countries, and we need to find a balance. That is why we said in the German Council Presidency that we want to work together with the European institutions and as a first step develop a common European threat analysis to have a common basis and in subsequent presidencies Slovenia and Portugal, they can then work on this basis and I think it's a useful it's useful that you remind us um, of the of how different Europe's strategic challenges look when you're not a rich wealthy country in the middle of Europe but a small country on the periphery and that Germany has a responsibility to take that into account. Minister, you've been really generous in giving us 30 minutes of your time. But before I let you go, I would like to remind us that there is one question of German national politics that is of enormous interest to Germany's allies. <clears throat> and that's the question of who, since Chancellor Merkel has firmly ruled out a fifth term, will be your party's candidate for the succession. December of this year marks not only the end of the German EU presidency, but the month when your party, the CDU, has to choose a new leader. And who, at least according to tradition, will also be the presumptive candidate for chancellor in the fall 2021 elections. You announced in February that you are no longer a candidate. And that 
frankly, February now seems like another century, and an awful lot has happened to all of us since then. And you, of course, are still party leader. So I want to ask you, have you regretted your decision? No, I have not regretted my decision. I have not regretted it so far. I took it during a time when it was the right decision for the party and the right decision for me personally, and that continues to be the case. I use all my strength to make sure that in December, during our party convention, that I can fulfill a promise that I gave two years ago, that in terms of substance, in terms of personnel, and in terms of organization, we will have organized the party in a good way so that we can lead it into a successful election. Thank you very much. Am I right in thinking that you're quite enjoying being defense minister? It is a great honor to serve the security of a country and a great joy to work together with so many dedicated service members, men and women in my area of responsibility. It is a very challenging office, one with a new surprise every day, not always nice surprises, but I'm very happy that one year ago I decided to take up this office. All right. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, all the best to you um, in the Germany EU presidency and in your time as party leader until December. Thank you so much. Be well, and all of you stay healthy. Thank you from Washington. You're very welcome. Thank you for the interesting questions. All my best greetings to Washington, and take care.